Amazing. Well, hello there, NextGen fam, and welcome to another edition of Mentor Moments with NextGen HQ. We are so very honored to have Marian Salzman on with us today to share her experiences and all of her vast lessons with us. So sit back, take out your notebook, and enjoy. The conversation with Marian is going to cover a lot of topics because she is a woman of many, many talents. Marian has been named the top trend spotter and one of the most awarded female marketing executives in North America. Her communications career has spanned several decades, so you can imagine a ton of experiences behind that. And she is currently the SVP of communications at Philip Morris International, where she is focused on designing a smoke-free future for the company and also for the world. You know, just all in, all in a good day's work. Marion, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. Thanks for having me, it's gonna be fun. <laughs> We're so excited. We're going to dive right into this. So just to let you know, we have a little bit of a Next Gen HQ tradition here with rapid fires. So we can all get on the same page, kick off our shoes and just have a good chat together. My shoes you are already off, so I'm ready for you. <laughs> Amazing. Okay, so I'm going to throw some quick questions out and whatever comes to mind comes to mind. Okay. First off, what is a book that you most highly recommend to others? So for me right now, definitely Michelle Obama Belonging. It's a great one. I definitely need to add that to the list. <laughs> How about, are you a summer or a winter lover? I am a hater of winter, which makes me a summer lover. I was walking around last week, this week in Switzerland, still wrapped in my kitty blanket because I'm <laughs> freezing, even though it's probably 70 degrees outside. That's so, that's so funny. I also saw that you uh, went to Brown and lived in Providence, Rhode Island. I'm also a fellow Brunonian. Okay. So those, those winters must have not been super fun for you. I was there for the blizzard of 76 as a freshman where people were diving out of my second and third floor Emory Woolley dorm oh. uh, landing in the snow. So yes, I know what a Rhode Island winter is. Oh. I also, I, when I went home um, from Switzerland during the uh, lockdown, I went to our beach cottage um, near Narragansett, Rhode Island. So I spent eight weeks in a thousand square feet with one husband and two golden retrievers living the winter. So believe me, I remember it really well in current memory. <laughs> summer, summer all the way. How about what's one healthy habit that you have? I try to walk between three and four miles every single day. I can't say I accomplish it, but Someone along the way told me you would never be all that unhealthy if you got in those steps. So no matter where in the world I am, I will put on flat shoes and get the walk in. I love that. And finally, what is a top song that you almost always have on repeat? Okay, it's a really stupid one. So I'm disclosing this with full embarrassment. I should say it's Bruce Springsteen, Born to Run, but the truth is it's Rufus Wainwright and Hallelujah. Oh, love that. We'll definitely make sure to have that song linked in the comments when, when we go to release this so you can bet that's coming for you. <laughs> Marianne, that, thank you so much for enjoying those rapid fires with us and now we can kind of dive into dive into the good stuff and hear a little bit a little bit more about your journey. I know that and, and kind of in doing some research behind this that you've been named one of the world's top trend spotters which is so fantastic and congratulations on getting to that to that accomplishment in your journey. Uh, I kind of want to ask and dive into if this came naturally for you or has it really been a journey throughout your professional career to get here? So coming of age in the 80s as a woman, I'm not sure we knew the destination um, and I'm someone who always put the quality of the journey first. I fell into being a trend spotter. I was a sociology major at Brown I did a little bit of graduate work in sociology at Harvard. I hated the theory, I loved the practice. And I started my career really doing um, qualitative market research. And if you're good at it, you end up not only answering your clients' questions, but also starting to see what's going to come next. And um, I think it had to do partially with being a woman in that point of time. You soon find yourself in the media making tough. And then all of a sudden someone else calls you a trend spotter. And then it was always really important to me that I was never really a trendsetter. I was much more of somebody who could translate what was happening out there and make it palatable to people that were on the inside in the corporate world. Are there any kind of particular skills that you've really had to hone in on to get to this point? So it's nonlinear nerdiness. 
So what do I mean by nonlinear? Today it's so easy to be a nonlinear nerd because Google and every other search engine lets you just go and move from topic to topic. But early on in my career, I realized it was the ability to link two unrelated things together and come up with a third hypothesis. And so, so much of my life has been spent not providing answers, but actually, actually asking questions, some of which I swear to you were probably pretty dumb, but I had this wonderful halo of, oh, she graduated with honors from Brown. So it, might be a, it must be a smart question. We're not understanding what she's saying. And I traded off that for at least a decade and a half. Wow, I love that. It seems like a lot of this kind of really started for you in those early years of your, of your professional journey, honing in on these skills and figuring out what this process was of really becoming a trend spotter, it does seem. A lot of it had to do with choosing the right boss. I've never been worried about who my what my job title is gonna be, not even what you're gonna pay me. It's always been who am I gonna work for and with and how are they gonna teach me? And even down to joining Philip Morris International, I'm a never smoker. I had no experience when they first called me, I was like, you have to be kidding. And in meeting Andre Kolonzopoulos, who's my CEO, I just was like, I can work with this man. I can do great things. I can learn a lot. I can make a contribution. But it goes all the way back. I mean, I probably had 38 jobs, but prior to Philip Morris, other than my startups, only three real employers. I just get kind of cherry picking the next opportunity. So I kept getting different job titles, but I always chose what to do next based upon the quality of the person I was going to answer to and it was going to provoke me. I love that. And here you are today, having gone through so many different leadership opportunities yourself. I know that in your career, you kind of held, held a lot of these positions and have really been instrumental in building a path forward for the future. But I'd love to, I'd love to kind of hit, hit home on that. Does a particular moment stand out in your career, maybe even working with another individual uh, that really made yeah. you feel, yes, I need to be a leader. This, I need to be a part of the change for what's coming. So absolutely, there's a, two or three points. I'd say one was very, very recent where I was kind of, not at the end of my career, but kind of, I'd been the CEO for Havas PR for almost nine years. I was totally happy. I adore my former boss, who's still now one of my closest friends. I, I could have kept doing that for forever. And then headhunters would always call, but I wasn't interested And then this thing came along and the next thing you know, I was packing boxes once again and moving to Switzerland. Um, but it goes back to in 1992 or 1993, I had this little startup company. It wasn't worth very much, but it was, um, I, I had the right to do online market research um, exclusively on AOL. People didn't know what it was worth. I shouldn't, shouldn't say it wasn't worth very much. I didn't realize what I had. And someone said to me, you need to go and see this man called Jay Shiat because Nickelodeon is your client, Nickelodeon is his client. And I went to this meeting and I showed up in my typical sort of half preppy, half hippie like way. And at the end of the meeting, I realized that my company had now just become part of this ad agency called Shy Day, best known for launching Apple in 1984. And suddenly I was reporting to this advertising guru and his, his basic ethos was good enough is never enough. And for someone like me, that was the perfect challenge because no matter how hard I tried, I knew that there was 5% more I could do. And working in an environment that he had curated where it was about art, it was about conversation, it was about provocation, it was just golden for me. And then soon thereafter, our agency, I mean, his agency, I shouldn't say our agency, I just worked there. His agency was acquired by Omnicom. And they came along and they said, well, do you wanna go do what you're doing? Um, which was called head of the department, director of the department of the future. Do you want to go do it in Europe? And I had a golden retriever puppy. So I said, well, I have to go to a country. I can take my puppy with me. And the next thing you know, there was this moving truck in front of my apartment in New York city. And I was moving to the Netherlands. And I went there when there was probably three to 4% internet penetration. And I stayed long enough, which was basically just a couple of years that 40% of the country was then online. And over the course of that time, I went from being director of the Department of the Future, overseeing new media for Europe, Middle East, and Africa. They then added Asia. So it was like this, just um, things kept falling into my lap because 
the only thing I have that's different than other people is this complete no fear of failure. Because to me, failure is simply an opportunity to get better. So I, I wouldn't say I'm a huge risk taker, but I have no fears about jumping in head first. I, I love that. And I think that's something that a lot of our entrepreneurs can take away with. Most of the time, it's, it's seeing an opportunity and running at it as fearlessly as you can to really make to really make something of it and build whatever that passion is on the side. But I would say there's one other piece to it too. It's also knowing when to pivot. It's knowing when to take advice. It's knowing that a good idea can always be a better idea. That can always be a greater idea. And you're constantly kind of chasing that great series of moments, but never resting. Um, and I'd say that goes back to my education but it also goes back to my early jobs. It goes back to working for Jay in the 90s. It goes back to what I'm doing now. I mean, I, I, am, I went to Brown because I didn't wanna take math or science. And here I am um, in a fact-based, evidence-based company where even last night I had a two-hour tutorial on science. And I, even now I find myself, at least today, thank God again for Google. They're saying words at me and I'm Googling and I'm writing down the word and I'm like, making these post-it notes of like, learn this word, learn that word. Um, I think it's so important that you have the ability to zig and zag as the market changes and as you get new data points. Exactly. The, the power of a pivot at the right moment in time when you need it is undeniable. Yeah. Amazing. So it seems, it seems kind of just from our conversation that education is a really important part for for where you're at in your journey, kind of going to Brown, Google searching things that come up and really wanting to expand all of, all of the knowledge that you have and continue to grow. I have, uh, I have an even sadder thing to admit after 30 odd years, I am now a part-time master's student at Johns Hopkins getting a master's degree in government because in, my, in coming to this job, I realized I thought I knew a lot about government and politics, and I know a lot about how systems work, but I realized I needed to go back to school. So my greatest fear and anxiety, the biggest thing keeping me up at night is homework and the endless need to go back and read at this late age to Tocqueville. So everybody else will have a really good weekend. I will have my weekend with de Tocqueville. <laughs> So oh, okay. congratulations on making that. Oh, I'm sorry. You should maybe say I'm sorry, like, because I'm not sure it was the smartest thing I could have signed up for, because I <laughs> applied and I was like, yes, I'll start in the summer session. This is all before the pandemic. And then there I was in Rhode Island ordering books, knowing I was coming back to Switzerland. And oh my God, would my books get here in time? I mean, so in many ways, that's maybe another lesson you can take for me is never grow up. Um, no matter how old or how weary I get, I still judge myself on my ability to keep learning mm -hmm. and to keep growing and also to potentially face defeat. I have two classes right now. One is coming very easily. Uh, one is coming not very easily. Um, in fact, I had to go back and learn how to do footnotes in the age of the internet, which is, um, it's been a very long time since I had to footnote anything let them because in the corporate world you simply provide sourcing so it's you know you have to um never grow up never grow up continue soaking in all of the knowledge that you can and making pivots along the way it seems yeah. like those are the those are some of the top lessons that you've come across in your in your career sadly yes <laughs> <laughs> i would love to i would love to ask and, and kind of start to wrap this question up because we've talked a lot about reading and, and purchasing books, but you also have a background as an author. And from what I've seen, over, over a dozen books yeah. that have been authored by you? I've, I've written 15 books. I've always I said that after I did Agile PR um, a couple of years ago, I was retiring from the book writing field. Right now, I'm in a conversation about doing a book about what this whole period in time means. And like with every other book I undertook since my first one, I have this great enthusiasm. You put together your chapter by chapter outline, you speak to perspective. In this case, um, it's only a single editor and if he doesn't buy the book, I probably won't do the book. But you get so excited and then you face the fact that it's like writing, um, 12 honors theses. 
um, over the course of, I mean, thank God book publishing is still pretty Byzantine because at least I would have a year to get it done. But I, I think that is another dimension of the who I am. I always sign up for a little bit too much. I make myself absolutely crazy trying to get it done. But it's also what keeps your brain firing on all cylinders. So it seems as though authoring, authoring books, it's not even just kind of the action and the final product. It's, it's the journey of, of learning and growth that comes through the writing of it. Well, it's also the um, air cover you get, to, again, ask questions that aren't that intelligent and start um, pulling out of other people's heads, whether it's things they've already written, things that they've already contributed to the zeitgeist, or things that you can ask them directly. It opens up doors for different people to give you their inputs that you don't get when you're just kind of sitting around as a corporate executive. It doesn't matter. Look, I have a huge job. I'm fully aware of that responsibility but I need a chance to ask some not so smart questions. You need a chance to ask them and, and not feel as though you shouldn't be asking them because sometimes yeah. all, all we can really do and the way that we learn is by speaking up and, and asking those questions that are yeah. on our minds. <laughs> I love it. Well, Marion, I want to take this time to thank you so much for coming on to Mentor Moments and sharing a, a piece of your journey with us. We do so appreciate that. Uh, but to end this conversation, we'd love to hear from you on one, one final question to wrap this up. Uh, what is your hope for the next generation of leaders to come? I hope that women and men, people of all races, all sexual orientations, um, all backgrounds, I didn't come from a particularly affluent background, I came from a very middle class background, that they find the opportunities and they seize the opportunities. I had the luxury of being the first, well, not maybe the second generation of women that came into the workforce semi-welcomed. Um, and I just hope that people stick with it and um, you know, early on, someone said to me, Marion, it doesn't matter how many people reject you. It's where you're getting, it's, it's who says yes. And I hope that despite all of the systemic racism, all the systemic sexism, people understand that they can make their own way. And it's possible. You just have to have a really agile approach. You have to have a resilient spirit and you have to be prepared to be rejected a lot more than you get accepted. And what a beautiful way to end this conversation. Thank you so much for that, Marianne. Everyone, you've heard it directly, directly from her. You can be on this journey and grow this path and be the leader that's within you. So I think, I think we're going to leave them on that, Marianne. Does that sound like a good idea? <laughs> Great. Thank you, guys. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.